The Canada Caribbean Research Symposium was the inaugural event of the Canada Caribbean Institute, which was formed as part of the partnership between the University of the West Indies and Brock University. The Canada Caribbean Institute aims to provide a focal point for multidisciplinary research and teaching to deepen and improve the multifaceted relationships between Canada and the Caribbean and examine issues affecting Caribbean diaspora communities in Canada. The symposium presented current research and projects being conducted on issues pertinent to Canada and the Caribbean. Panel 3 focused on health and the environment and featured presentations from Dr. Damian Kohal, Deputy Dean and Senior Lecturer in the Faculty of Medical Sciences at the UWI, and Dr. Liet Vasser, Professor in the Faculty of Mathematics and Science at Brock University. The panel was moderated by Dr. Barbara Carby, Director of the Disaster Risk Reduction Center at the UWI. Welcome to our session on health and the environment. I am the person who is supposed to guide you through this session. My name is Barbara Carby. I am the Director of the Disaster Risk Reduction Center, which comes under the Institute for Sustainable Development in the Office of the Vice Chancellor. Um, we have this afternoon two speakers who are seated to my right. And going with the traditional uh, protocol in these matters, I will first introduce the lady, Professor Liette Vasseur. She's from Biological Sciences, and she's the UNESCO Chair in Community Sustainability also a member of the Brock Environmental Sustainability Research Center. So evidently, her practice is very interdisciplinary, right? Um, Dr. Vassar is a full professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Brock, and she's also a member of the Women and Gender Studies Program and the Environmental Sustainability Research Center, one of five transdisciplinary spaces at the university. And she's held the UNESCO chair since 2014. And she currently leads a thematic group on climate change adaptation of the Commission for Ecosystem Management at the IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature. That's a, a very brief summary of her accomplishments. <laughs> Beside her is Dr. Damien Kohol, uh, Dr. Kohol is currently the Deputy Dean at a and a Senior Lecturer in Pharmacology in the Faculty of Medical Sciences, and he's located at the Orcavia campus. Uh, he has worked in medical cannabis and has given numerous presentations on this topic, both locally and regionally, and he has published extensively on the use of medicinal plants and their bioconstituents, and that includes, of course, medical um, cannabis. One of his most recent publications is a joint research effort with Dr. Alana Griffith, entitled Conceptualizing a Policy Framework for the Implementation of Medical Marijuana in the Caribbean Territory of Barbados, and that was published in the journal Drug Science, Law, and Policy. And that piece of research was awarded the best industry applied research at UE Cave Hills Research Week in 2018. And I dare say it's a very important piece of work because I find so often in the Caribbean that practice guides policy rather than the other way around where policy should be guiding practice. So it's good that we're tackling the policy issue of medical <coughs> cannabis very early on. All right, that's enough for me. I am going to ask our speakers then to make their presentations. First up, we have Dr. Kohol. A pleasant good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as the uh, moderator uh, <clears throat> mentioned, my name is Damien Kohol. I'm the Deputy Dean Preclinical of the Faculty of Medical Sciences based in Barbados. Uh, some of my colleagues here from Canada uh, may not know that the University of West Indies is one of two transatlantic universities in the world, and we are proud of that. And uh, uh, being transatlantic, we have three main campuses, one here in Jamaica, Mona Campus, 
one in Barbados, the Cavill campus, and one in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, <coughs> uh, St. Augustine campus. Most recently, we have the uh, campus which was established in Antigua, and we also have an open campus. Uh, so uh, when you look at all of our campuses, we are well established throughout the region. Uh, today, I will be speaking on the medicinal cannabis industry. And this is a large topic because cannabis has so many different aspects to it, which can be discussed within uh, 15 minutes, an hour, probably a whole day. But because I am uh, metered by time, I am going to proceed into my presentation, which is going to be a very uh, cursory look out of a, of a SWOT analysis of the medicinal cannabis industry. And because uh, this symposium is primarily uh, collaborated, coll sorry, a primary collaboration between the University of the West Indies and Brock University, uh, my focus is going to primarily be on uh, the Caribbean, Jamaica, Barbados, which I'm very okay with. And I'm going to mention some points about what I've observed in Canada. And my other colleague will be able to come in and add to that or correct me where necessary. <clears throat> right, so I'm gonna start off by just giving a very uh, quick account of what a medicinal cannabis industry looks like, uh, but it essentially involves activities and professionals that are involved directly and indirectly in the legal production, transport, sale, consumption, or use of medicinal cannabis. Uh, so when we speak about these activities, we're speaking about anything from uh, cultivation, right, which generally start with our seeds. So our seed genetics are important because various strains of cannabis are known to produce uh, very interesting phytochemistry, uh, specific cannabinoids of interest, which are uh, labeled as medicinal. And I'm speaking primarily to uh, Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol and uh, our CBD, uh, which is cannabidiol. Sorry about that tongue twist. Um, so our seed genetics are very important. Uh, and then, of course, um, throughout cultivation, it's important that uh, there are specific practices that are well-contained, controlled. Quality assurance is very important, uh, which ensures that specific cultivars are uh, grown. And uh, from cultivation, we move into harvesting. We have extraction because we have to extract the oils. And these very important two uh, cannabinoids, even though they are far more cannabinoids than these two, uh, which identifies an opportunity for research, which I'll speak to later in my SWOT analysis. Uh, there is our crystallization because it might be important, especially if you're trying to identify one specific uh, compound over the next that you may want to crystallize and then reconstitute that in a vehicle uh, before uh, the product is actually marketed. And then, of course, um, you know, that itself could be a part of the uh, product manufacturing process after extraction. And then testing, very critical element, because it's important that products that are produced are uh, checked to ensure that all the necessary uh, quality specs are met. And then, of course, you have packaging, you have distribution, uh, retail, and, of course, uh, product going to um, your patient. Now, in terms of global trends that we have been observing uh, as it pertains to the actual uh, uh, consideration of cannabis to be used as a medicine and even the attitudes, uh, we have been seeing some changes, um, especially in this hemisphere. Uh, we could start off by speaking about Canada's experience with cannabis. Uh, medicinal cannabis is nothing new to Canada. In fact, uh, Canada has roughly over two decades or just about two decades uh, experience uh, with medicinal cannabis. Um, most persons who are observing what was happening in the region may have thought that the Caribbean's experience with cannabis in terms of medicinal research started in 2015 when laws were revised uh, or reformed in Jamaica to allow for that research to take place. Uh, but before, in my department, uh, in the Department of Basic Medical Sciences, I was a pharmacology student, so I was able to learn from the feet of Professor Manley West, who developed uh, drugs like Canosol which is used to treat glaucoma. Uh, more so, in 2017, uh, a regional commission was formed which actually looked at marijuana um, holistically, not only for medicinal or sacramental purposes, uh, and not only recreational purposes, to see if there was any value 
in this trend towards uh, reform in policy and law to allow for the use of cannabis um, within the region. And in 2018, they were able to put out a very important recommendation which said that uh, the actual uh, plant uh, should be reconsidered in terms of its classification. More so, uh, in uh, 2019, January, you had the 41st WHO Expert Committee on Drug Dependence who actually moved a similar motion where uh, various formulations of cannabis uh, or its resin, its extract, uh, was said um, could be reclassified uh, as uh, <clears throat> in contrast to it where it's currently scheduled um, uh, in the uh, <clears throat> UN Convention um, on narcotic uh, drugs, right, which was established in 1961 as a Schedule IV uh, uh, substance. And of course, Schedule IV substance means that uh, these substances are highly addictive, dangerous, and may not necessarily have um, any significant medicinal impact. But again, because we are trying to draw comparisons between Canada and the Caribbean, it's important to understand um, some of the policies and policy shifts that took place in um, in both territories. So in Canada, um, in 2016, after years of looking at regulations for medicinal cannabis, there was the access to cannabis for uh, medicinal purposes regulations. And uh, this regulation essentially uh, promoted more access to persons who needed to use cannabis. Uh, the previous regulations were frowned upon because there were instances where access was uh, considered to be confined. Uh, so in terms of access, reasonable use for medicinal purposes by authorized patients. So patients had to be authorized to use cannabis. Uh, it allowed for purchase. It also allowed for some amount of uh, domestic production uh, to allow, again, authorized patients or persons designated by those to actually uh, produce cannabis. Uh, new regulations came under the Cannabis Act in 2018 when uh, full-scale legalization was allowed, of course, with regulations. So, you know, the idea that anything goes in Canada is not necessarily so. There are indeed regulations uh, to support um, its uh, Cannabis Act of 2018. When you look at the region, there have been a lot of shifts and a lot of changes. We, I mentioned Jamaica in 2015, right, with an amendment of their Dangerous Drug Act. And then, of course, I mentioned the Regional Commission on Marijuana, uh, then we saw other states and territories in the Caribbean uh, making adjustments. We saw Belize in 2017 decriminalizing. Uh, we saw St. Kitts and St. Nevis establishing a commission. Antigua and Barbuda, again, did some legal reform to allow for decriminalization. And they also allow for use for religious purposes in Antigua. And of course, we can't not mention the US of A, who sits just below Canada, who was able to make some adjustments. I think at the end of 2018, roughly 33 states, uh, the District of Columbia, Guam, and Puerto Rico had made necessary um, legal reform and policy reform to allow for use of medicinal cannabis. St. Vincent and Grenadines uh, in 2018 uh, established three laws. One was for the establishment of a medicinal cannabis industry. Uh, the other was to allow for sacramental use. And uh, this other very important law spoke about uh, you know, addressing some of, some of the social injustice issues that uh, had arise because there was this new interest um, in looking at cannabis uh, as an economic uh, area for development. Um, and then looking at all of the Rastafarian and other persons who may have been uh, penalized and criminalized because of the use of cannabis and being caught uh, by uh, law enforcement. So this bill was looking at providing an amnesty and expunging this criminal record from persons who may have convicted of uh, a crime of a minor offense of possession previously. In 2019, Barbados did uh, establish uh, or start looking into establishing uh, their medicinal cannabis industry. Uh, before the end of the year, they were able to pass their bill at the level of the House of Assembly and Senate. Uh, so again, things are in the making and the most recent uh, advancement in the Caribbean would have been Trinidad and Tobago which decriminalized up to 30 grams uh, of, uh, for anyone to be caught um, without being penalized um, with the old draconial um, way of dealing with persons who would have caught with possession 
uh, but may probably just get a simple penalty or ticket um, uh, penalty for their position. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> So I did mention that in terms of the global trends towards medicinal cannabis, we see a lot of activity on the Western Hemisphere. Um, if we were to look on the Eastern end of the world, um, we see while Africa is now showing some interest in going that route, there is indeed some uh, uh, inertia, right? Uh, I believe South Africa and uh, one or two other states are definitely looking at establishing industries, if not established prior. Um, also, East Asia, um, where essentially cannabis was known to be used very early, um, seems to, <coughs> uh, Eastern Europe, sorry, um, seems to be very uh, reticent in terms of allowing for necessary reform to allow for medicinal cannabis industries. Um, I guess a certain level of conservatism on that side. Now, moving quickly into the uh, SWOT analysis, and I'm just going to go over some quick points here. And of course, we'll have some time after for question and answer. Uh, but strengths, why should uh, countries, territories considered establishing a medicinal cannabis industry? Uh, well, uh, the plant has been used as a medicine for over 5,000 years. Some of us may want to debate that, right? Um, uh, there are niche markets across the value chain uh, with the potential to stimulate economic activity. Um, in the islands of the Caribbean, which were traditionally agricultural colonies of Britain, Spain, uh, where we planted a lot of sugarcane, we were quick to export raw material, not only sugarcane, but other agricultural commodities. So we didn't look at the full value chain. So cannabis uh, presents an opportunity to look at establishing a value chain and, and, and benefiting from that economically. Um, we also know that there are projections which speak about the value of this industry. And um, there have been many numbers mentioned, uh, but here, uh, by the end of uh, 2017, it was said that the overall cannabis industry, global cannabis, legal, not illegal and legal, but the legal, would have uh, just risen about 57 billion, right? Um, with a third of that being occupied by uh, medicinal cannabis. So the, product, the projections have definitely increased, and you can see here on this slide, uh, market projections for the Latin America have uh, clearly identified medicinal cannabis within the Latin America as a billion dollar industry. <clears throat> so quickly identifying the weaknesses. Um, yes, uh, I did mention very briefly that there are conventions, the UN Convention of 1961, um, uh, which uh, addressed narcotic agents. There is also the 1971 Addendum on Psychotropic Agents, of course, have inhibited our ability to do uh, much needed research. Right? But these same conventions do allow for scientific and medicinal um, explorations, and I believe that is what has been uh, targeted by our governments in terms of making their necessary adjustments towards allowing uh, for research and medicinal use. I spoke about social injustices, yes, because the Rastafarians are now coming out to say that now you want to use this as an economic driver, um, but I have a criminal record. You know, who's going to address that issue? There's a certain level of training that is required, um, and uh, there is an uncertified workforce across the value chain that needs to be looked at. I understand that the doctors are not taking up CPE um, uh, programs as they should to learn a little bit more about the use of these cannabinoids uh, to treat specific conditions. And the tech vet training is not well established for cannabis industry in the Caribbean. We're working on that. Also very important, just like in other industries in manufacturing standards, and there are so many different standards. You have GMP, you have GPP, and of course you have GACP, which addresses the agricultural production and collection of material. Um, these standards are very difficult to attain, and licensed producers and persons who are quite keen on getting industry have in some difficulties um, trying to cover those standards. But just quickly, to identify the opportunities, which essentially could come from some of the weaknesses that I have identified, um, there is multiple avenues for the generation of IP through research. Uh, potential source for developing alternative energy. With all of that biomass that is going to left off for all of that extraction, you could use that to good use. Uh, you could stimulate a viable economy from the value chain of medicinal cannabis in the Caribbean. and. There are opportunities that are not just speaking about direct involvement in the value chain, but indirect employment opportunities. Um, you can have the small farmers and medium-sized enterprises being part of the industry. 
uh, through uh, cooperative, establishing cooperatives, which then can apply for licenses, right? And of course, there are potentials for intersectoral linkages with tourism, agriculture, education, and health. And this diagram here just gives a quick snapshot of what a cannabis industry looks like. It's not just about planting cannabis and selling cannabis or products from cannabis to patients, but you have education, you have tourism, right? Um, a colleague of mine was speaking about physiotherapy earlier, and I was saying, well, there's an opportunity for you as well. Long-term care facilities, persons who have surgeries and need an area to recuperate can use cannabis to manage the pain as opposed to opiates, opioids, less addiction, right? And you get a better care in the long run. But the threats, what continues to hold back some of us from exploring uh, cannabis as an industry? Uh, we know very much that THC, uh, Delta 9 uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, is known for its acute and chronic adverse effects. Uh, Long-term brain development issues, especially with youngsters or adolescents who start abusing it or using it extensively before the age of 15. That's what the research says. Um, there's a restricted list of qualifying conditions. So most persons will tell you that, oh yes, you can use it uh, for insomnia, for neuropathic pain, for spasticity, right? For epilepsy, right? Appetite stimulation. But because we have not been able to do the research, we have not been able to identify other potential uh, conditions where we can actually benefit from cannabis as a drug. But that research is ongoing. Uh, and of course, some elements of cultivation and production can be challenging, right? And I've listed some here. Um, diversion of cannabis from legal and illegal trade, right? That is a concern. So security systems have to be put in place to ensure that you don't have diversion of cannabis uh, being cultivated. Uh, use of arable land for cannabis versus crop production, small states like the Caribbean, when we should be worrying about planting food to eat, the food security, we're worrying about planting cannabis right, and not taking care of domestic matters. And there are others, uh, good quality considerations going down into the science of horticulture. Um, you find that cannabis, especially if you're looking at medicinal strains, there might be specific environmental factors which might allow for um, the, the strains of the specific plants um, to perform adequately. Humidity, temperature uh, being a couple. And uh, in wrapping up threats, um, it's important to note that uh, <clears throat> the products that have gone through uh, development and are considered pharmaceutical agents made from cannabis, like nabilone, dronabinol, which are synthetic products, uh, that they have a high cost associated with them, right? Uh, big one, US federal law still classify cannabis as a Schedule One drug, right, which denotes no medicinal value. and of course, that then impacts the third point, which is the banking of cannabis businesses problematic in the Western Hemisphere due to AML risks, anti-money anti -money laundering laws, of course, um, would restrict some amount of banking and access to banking, especially banks in the region which use US corresponding banks um, uh, for trade. And then last but not least, over-regulation of medicinal cannabis industry. There might just be this feeling that this cannabis industry is so um, difficult to manage and that there are so much threats, especially threats to young people who now see cannabis as a soft drug and would want to use it more often because it's now considered legal, right? Um, that we may over-regulate it and over-regulation doesn't allow industries to thrive, but they stifle the industries. All right, so in wrapping up, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues, uh, just to identify some quick concluding remarks, the medicinal cannabis industry is lucrative uh, with potential opportunities for trade and intersectorial growth, right, which of course can boost economic activity in our region. The main weaknesses are cost of, cost of investment. I spoke about security being one of the major concerns in terms of securing uh, the various entities which would secure a license for participating in that value chain, it comes at a high cost, right? The cost of the license plus the cost of the systems that have to be put in place. QA issues and uh, establishing standards to meet uh, these standards are important, right? Uh, <clears throat> there is also a very strong opportunity for R&D, and I think this should be what we focus on in the Caribbean. We are very quick to go for the fast money, and people think that if you invest money in research, research takes too long 
to bring uh, forward fruit. But if we invest the money in cannabis research and get the research done right, I believe that it might create an opportunity for us to not only have patents, but to make some money from some of our local derived IP. And then of course, the main threats would be uh, the current classification of cannabis until uh, cannabis classification is changed um, under the UN conventions. And also as is scheduled in the US, we will still have some of the issues with the cash industry that we have now for cannabis, which then itself could have other indirect consequences like security issues, right? And uh, businesses won't be allowed to thrive because trade will be essentially uh, nullified to some extent due to some of these banking issues. So that is it. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm going to ask Professor Vassar now to come and speak to us. Healthy planet, healthy people, a journey from local to global. Uh, again, thank you all the organizer, uh, Camille especially, and uh, Christine and all the people who have uh, prepared this. It's uh, great to see and finally me meet some uh, most likely new colleagues as well now. <laughs> so this is uh, one wonderful. So what I will be talking is really a journey for me, a journey that uh, started, uh, uh, I should say, almost during my uh, uh, postdoc, but that has evolved. And uh, you'll see what I mean by that uh, gradually. I want to uh, first say, yeah, I'm, I'm a UNESCO chair uh, at Brock University, Community Sustainability. Uh, my research, uh, it's kind of interesting, as interesting because I, while I grew up as a biologist, if you want to put it that way, um, I moved quite gradually towards more social sciences and humanities, and for different reasons. Is you cannot, when you work uh, in sustainability, think only about like a crop or an animal. You have to look at its full entirety, and that means that you have to look at the environment, but also at the human level. You have to put the two together. So uh, my research is in, currently in Niagara, uh, but also in China, in Ecuador. I uh, have some also links with uh, Costa Rica, Mexico, uh, as well as uh, previously Burkina Faso and Cambodia, for example. So I've been a bit uh, in the different continents at different times. Uh, and what I'm trying to put together is really looking at the community. And usually I work with coastal or rural communities, uh, some are indigenous communities, and looking at their livelihood. What does it mean to be all together in terms of sustainable agriculture, uh, the issue of climate change, uh, issues of uh, gender uh, equality, for example, are very important in this case. So I always try to portray my kind of research program as a triangle, uh, a triangle that moves. So it's not a, talking a bit about our earthquake at lunch today. Yeah, I felt like yeah, mine is a bit like that too. Uh, so I look at the large landscape in terms of the community sustainability. So there's a question of communities. Uh, and with that, that means the question of human rights, the question of governance, for example, that are very important, social justice. On the other side, sustainable agriculture, and I always talk about the fact that human, like any animals, we have basic needs. Water, food, shelter. We have added health and security in our case and education, but when we look at that, we need uh, sustainable agriculture. Uh, and that means, uh, for example, question of food security. And finally, we have to deal with a lot of changes. And these changes are climate and environmental ones. And uh, they are very important. And they will, if you want, move this structure all the time in terms of ecosystem services. So are we getting the water? Are we getting the food, the timber that we need? But also in terms of public health, question of capacity building, question of social justice. So a little bit uh, like we were talking, it's not just a question of the plant, it's a question of the full system. So the reflection I have for several years now is how do we work with that when we look at sustainable agriculture? And we really need to better integrate all the technological aspects, the ecological, economic, political, health, culture, social aspects of the social ecological system. We cannot separate. You cannot just look at the yield itself. 
And this is what I've changed quite a lot in terms of my vision when I look uh, at how to do my research. Even if I'm a biologist originally and I still do fundamental research, there's all these other components that have to be considered at one point or another. Uh, so the picture there is from China, uh, one of our sites uh, where we do polyculture. One of the principles we're using in sustainable agriculture is what we call diversification. Using biodiversity to help, help, to help uh, improve the health of the environment. And that relates directly to the SDGs. All UNESCO chairs, we are in the marching orders of uh, the UN. So we are at the, the marching order of the SDGs. Uh, and you know, there are 17 bucks, 17 boxes there. And unfortunately, sometimes people are thinking just at one at a time, and, and, it, and we have no choice in some cases. But you have to remember, they're all interrelated. They are all interdependent. You cannot have no poverty if you don't have decent work. You cannot have zero hunger if you don't have land. So they're all interrelated. And we have to keep that in mind when we do uh, work on sustainable development. So one of the aspects in, in, uh, when I look at social, uh, sustainable agriculture and the environment is uh, what I call so soil health. If we don't have soil, you have no plant to grow. And that's basic. So, and what it means is that we have to figure out how to make a soil healthy. This is the most important part. You know that we're starting next year in 2021, two UN decades. One is on the ocean science for sustainable development. The other one is on ecosystem restoration. The ecosystem restoration one will be under the umbrella of the UNDP and FAO, Food Administration, the reason agriculture organization. And the reason is that soil, soil restoration will be one of the priority. If you have no soil and you, you said that very well, you know, the land is a big threat, it's a big concern, and that's something that we have to keep in mind. So uh, just finishing now this month, uh, a uh, what we call an Ontario-China Research Innovation Fund project, uh, which was uh, one type of project that you'll see will lead me to even cannabis very soon. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a project that uh, we use cover crops and agrominerals, uh, and especially in this case, we call it the Spanish River Carbonatite. It's a mine that we have close to Sudbury in Northern Ontario in Canada. And uh, as a stra two strategies to try to improve soil health. And in our case, we were working in uh, Ontario in vineyards and in China in tea plantations. In both cases, there's a need of restoration. People don't realize, but they have been using uh, abuse, I would say, uh, synthetic chemicals, uh, fertilizer, pesticide, uh, use of copper, because copper is used a lot against mildew, accumulates in soil, by the way. Uh, so these are issues that are coming now uh, to uh, face a lot of uh, industries. So we have to start thinking about how to restore these conditions. So just to give you an idea, uh, these are some of our cover crops. Uh, that we did some testing. Uh, we are doing testing in greenhouse conditions, but also in the field, in the win in operational vineyards and tea plantations. And this is just uh, one picture of uh, the uh, plants grown after 30 days in Centitic 2020-20 fertilizer and PK, uh, and uh, the SRC, which is the uh, Spanish River Carbonatite. And as you can see, what is interesting, we know it's species dependent. But what is interesting is there are many species that are responding very well to this agromineral. What is interesting, this is a natural product. The mine itself is very big. Uh, the estimate is they can mine for at least two to 400 years. So I, don't, we, I think we don't need to worry too much about running out of stock tomorrow morning, uh, which is very important because most people probably don't know. But uh, when we look at phosphate, which is an essential element, we only have for around 35 years of supply. So at one point, the agricultural industry will be in big trouble for that. So what I look at at the farm level is really looking at the interaction, crop, soil, 
what are the cover crop, what are the amendments, but all the biotic diversity, the pests, the invertebrates, the plants, the weeds, the abiotic factors, uh, the soil nutrients, soil chemistry, environmental weather conditions are super important. But at the same time, looking at the, the other component that are not directly looking at the farm itself or the, the plot itself, but all the issues of, uh, for example, the farm and the farmer's perception, social aspect, the economic aspects, the management aspects, because they are important and they will influence what's happening in terms of the ecosystem itself. So it's why you need the social and the uh, ecological aspect to know if it's going to work or not. You cannot just stay at the yield level for the crop. Uh, as I said, I'm integrating also climate change. Right now, we're just in the second, starting soon, the second year of a long-term project with Agriculture Agri Food Canada on climate change in vineyards. The same way, trying to see how we can enhance health of vineyards, uh, organic vineyards again, uh, through different components, irrigation, cover crop, etc. And at the same time, I work with communi communities, rural communities, coastal communities. And in this case, it's to look at how vulnerabilities of people in nature uh, are going to face, especially now with extreme weather events. It's becoming more frequent. I know we were talking about that at lunchtime. It is in for the Caribbean. It is for Canada. It is for many regions of the world. Uh, it's influenced at the same time by environmental degradation, social issues that is education, livelihood, uh, and always economy, the markets, the trades, the social economic activities that people can do or not. Uh, so the, what Natalia was talking about, this is the type of things that can be impacted a lot by climate change. And in fact, gender, the woman aspects is very important when we look at that. Uh, and as well, uh, looking at uh, if we want healthy communities and healthy people, we need a healthy functioning ecosystem. So one of the things that, uh, that we are working a lot on right now, and we, because I have a big lab, I should say, uh, over 20 people, uh, and I'm part also of different networks. One of them is the International Union for Conservation of Nature. I'm currently the uh, vice chair for North America for the Commission on Ecosystem Management. And we are working right now, in fact, uh, I got the document this morning because we have to finish it this week because it's going to be presented at the World Conservation Congress in Marseille in June for adoption by the Council, so that means by all the countries, uh, on a nature-based solution standard. And uh, so what we're trying to promote through that is ensuring societal challenges can be resolved through nature-based solutions to help having benefits from nature and human at the same time. So we're trying really to, again, put this perspective together. And it's through conservation, restoration, sustainable management of the resources. And it's really trying to enhance the capacity of local communities. So that's one thing that is important. Why it's important, uh, for those who have uh, links to uh, OECD, you probably heard that uh, the UN has uh, just put a uh, report this morning that 105 of the 169 targets of the SDGs are directly linked to implementation at the local level. So that's to be kept in mind. So just to give you a bit some other projects, uh, which you'll see have high potential link to uh, what's happening here, uh, are projects on climate change in terms of uh, uh, coastal communities. So uh, currently we have what we call a MEOPAR. This is an, a, a National Center of Excellence in Canada uh, looking at uh, different aspects related to maritime, ocean observation and uh, research. And uh, in our case, it's working to look at vulnerability adaptation and planning and also implement implementation. Why do people implement or not action to help them to be more resilient to climate change. And this is done not only in our case in the town of Lincoln in the Niagara region, but we have partner across uh, the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So we're doing quite a, a long way uh, with different communities. 
This work is not new for me. Uh, I started, uh, in fact, my postdoc was on climate change in, uh, on agricultural land, uh, but worked also uh, with the city of uh, Greater Sudbury, uh, where we looked especially at the uh, extreme events. So what you have is a flood in the underpass. Uh, we did the same. We had a project for six years uh, with uh, the SHRC, with the Social Sciences and Research uh, uh, Council on the coastal communities uh, in New Brunswick uh, PEI, so Prince Edward Island and uh, Quebec, again on extreme events, uh, as well uh, which produced a book called uh, Climate Change Adaptation to Coastal uh, Storms in Atlantic Canada, uh, which many of these lessons learned can be transposed gradually. And we have created tools to be able to help communities, coastal communities working with that as well as uh, sea level uh, rise projects in uh, New Brunswick. Because sea level rise is a big issue, and I know it's a big issue here. I've been uh, in uh, some of the islands, and I'm aware of uh, the conditions and how gradually we're losing even traditional places, historical places. And that's something that uh, we have seen also in Canada. Uh, so what I'm trying to do uh, is really linking sustainability, biodiversity, environment, uh, nutrition, and health. And we tend to sometimes put them at three bubbles, a little bit separate. What we're trying to do through transdisciplinary research is really to put them back together uh, and looking at the tools like nature-based solutions, su sustainable solution, to try to integrate all these components together uh, and to be able to gradually uh, figure out how to do this better. It means that it's not me alone. I have friends that, and colleagues that are in the humanities, in social sciences, in public health. Uh, usually my, the teams that I'm working with often more than 12, 15, 20 people. And because we need to have these different perspectives. This is necessary. Uh, so just to finish, I'll give you a couple of upcoming research and you'll see that some are directly related to what we uh, have been talking here. Uh, one is in the integrative approach of uh, sustainable development in rural communities uh, and enhancing especially uh, resilience to climate change and environmental changes. Uh, this is some pictures of uh, the Paramos and, uh, and uh, Chimborazo in Ecuador. Um, the other one is on cannabis, uh, and these are just plants uh, from different places, uh, and because we're working mostly on the me medical level, uh, but again, looking at the full pictures, again, that uh, from the, the plant to the social, economic, and cultural aspects, uh, and China, uh, where I work as well, uh, and Australia are highly interested by this kind of approach as well. And finally, uh, we have to leave a legacy, and the legacy is our youth. We have to remember that they are the ones who have to deal with the consequences of what we're doing today. They are the leaders of tomorrow, and uh, for me, this is a reflection that I continue, how to keep the nature-human connection so that they will be able to better enjoy uh, than what we're destroying right now. So this is a part for me that is quite important as well. So to keep this perspective for the future generation. So thank you very much.